Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Human Behavior Podcast. This week, we are joined by a very special guest, board certified behavior analyst, Kendall Rindak Samuel. Kendall joined us to talk about the fascinating world of applied behavior analysis, showing how it can transform fields like education, sports, and corporate system. Join us as we debunk common myths and gain an enriched understanding of human behavior, all while Kendall shares her dual expertise in behavioral sports psychology and dissemination. During the episode, Kendall discussed the value of ongoing research beyond initial education, highlighting how honing observational skills in daily life can strengthen both personal and professional relationships. She also touches on the pitfalls of self-diagnosis on social media and underscores the need for ethical standards and changing behaviors that genuinely impact individuals' lives. Effective communication is crucial in behavior analysis, and Kendall excels at translating complex terms into accessible language. She recently wrote a book called Talk Behavior to Me, the Routledge Dictionary of the Top 150 Behavior Analytic Terms and Translations. She wrote that so that the average person can better understand the different terms used in behavioral analysis. Tune in for practical insights and strategies to enhance your observational skills and deepen your understanding of human behavior guided by Kendall's expert perspective. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode and please check out our Patreon channel where we have a lot more content as well as subscriber only episodes of the show. If you enjoy the podcast, I'd kindly ask that you leave us a review, and more importantly, please share it with a friend. Thank you for your time, and don't forget that training changes behavior. All right, hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. Greg, we have a very special guest who I would like you to introduce yourself. We have Kendall Rindak Samuel, who is a BCBA, a behavior analyst, and Kendall, thank you so much one for coming on the show and tell everyone a little bit uh, about you so we can jump to the fun part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, So yeah, I am a board certified behavior analyst. Um, I am different than a psychologist. I feel like a lot of people, when they ask me, what do you do? I go, I'm a behavior analyst. And they go, like a social worker? And I go, nope. And they go, "Like like a counselor, like a what do you do? I'm like, nope, not that either. <laughs> um, so I am a professional who um, I study the environment and I try to analyze and understand what is causing different behaviors to happen. Um, and then if it's significant enough, uh, we put in strategies to change those. Um, so it could be something as small as teaching somebody how to make a sandwich, um, or it could be as, you know, grand as, you know, changing an entire, um, system at a company on, you know, how you can decrease turnover and putting in incentive systems, um, and all that. But what I specifically do, I work in two areas. I work in behavioral sports psychology. So I'm a private, uh, softball instructor. So I use behavior analysis to teach all of my students how to pitch, how to field properly. Um, I'm using behavioral performance, um, in order to help them grow their skills, um, which is a little bit different than just typical coaching because typical coaching, you just might look at someone and be like, huh, all right, this looks like this is going wrong. Let's try this. Whereas I kind of track progress over time. Um, and I track the strategies that I'm using. And then I also work in dissemination. So I teach people how to talk about behavior analysis very basically. And I teach people about what it is because not many people know about it. So long and short, I do a lot. No, that that's that's perfect. And this is why um, I was also interested to have you on. And, and for anyone listening, we Greg and I a while back were on um, uh, the Behavior Bitches podcast, which was a fun one. Awesome. And they're BCBAs. They do they do a whole lot of stuff. Um, and and they're they're just fun to talk to. And um, you know, and we've also been on the like the. Texas Association of School Psychologists. They have their own uh, a podcast as well. We we went on there with them, and you know the, the reason. And you, I, I love how you hit it up right here with your your sort of your softball example. Is that it's kind of like one we get the same question when I tell people I you know work in human behavior or do something like that. They're like, oh, are you reading me right yeah. now? Can you tell me that? I'm like, I'm like. You know, first of all, I'm like, ma'am, you know, leave me alone. I'm trying to have a drink, uh, you know, but that's my usual response. <laughs> but uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, 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 so there's a lot of misconceptions. And what I also like about folks like you and then the behavior bitches as well um, is, you know, you're a practitioner, right? And And so Greg and I are practitioners, right? We're not just studying and writing and reading about this stuff at a university level or an a- academic setting, which is great. You, you need to have that stuff. But, you know, we're all about the application 
application of it. And so you brought up two sort of completely different areas, um, which which is interesting to me. One, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of the BCBAs, a lot of this work, you know, a lot has to do with kids and mm -hmm. people think about like, uh, like autism mm -hmm. or, or different issues. Like my mom was an occupational therapist. She actually just recently retired. Um, so she worked with a lot of real young kids, like zero to three yeah. on some of those basic things, like how to feed yourself, how to, you know, pick up, you know, these different things. And, and so you're looking, it's, be, it's very behavioral based. Um, and then you put in different in intervention strategies. But what really fascinated me too is because you have a background in, in softball and you're a coach mm -hmm. is you're looking at it from not just a coaching perspective and maybe softball experience, but like what you know about behavior. And I, I'll, you know, I'll ask you, but in my, you know, since I've been doing this for a long time, it's sort of like once you get in and understand some of the underlying principles of behavior and how humans are, it's like, it opens up this world yeah. that touches everything. everything. So I kind of, yeah. I, so I kind of want to get like your perspective on that because we even have listeners uh, from all different backgrounds. Like mm -hmm. we have a lot of like law enforcement, first responders, some military folks listen, uh, but we also have like fraud investigators. We have just interested parents. We have people who just want to keep themselves safe because yeah. we, we deal a lot with like sort of what people call threat recognition. That's not what, what we really do. We, we you know, but, but it, it is in a sense. So it goes everywhere. And so sometimes that can become nebulous to people. They're like, well, what do you mean? Like it's, it touches everything. Yeah. So I kind of want to get your perspective on that or what were your experience in dealing with something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's what made me fall in love with this science is that I saw this opportunity for a lot of people call it a technology um, because it, it really is this like huge like grouping of strategies and how to um, how to analyze what's going on and strategies for that and then strategies to change behavior if you need to and to teach skills and to you know work on like increasing motivation which is how we live. Um, and yeah. I just found that it was so fascinating because I, I really hadn't seen anything like that before in my life, even like learning about general psychology in high school. Um, it was cool. But then when you got to like operant and classical conditioning, I was like, wait a second, this is actually how people learn how to do things. This is how people get motivated to get out of bed, to go to their job to have kids, like everything. So if you can understand the basics of that, that's like a superpower. So, and, and working in the field that that that's what you do for a job. It's so cool. So, um, I really wanted to go into this because I was like, well, I, there's, there's no way there's a job for this. Like in high school and in college, I was like, I'm this, I'm so good at this, like breaking down all the operants and, and learning about how Pavlov made his dog salivate and all of that, but there can't be an actual job for that. Well, there is. Um, and I, I was so excited, um, because again, I felt like I was going to learn about a superpower that I could teach everybody else about. Um, then when I get into it, I, I learned that it's actually kind of a narrow practice right now. There are all these different things that we can do with the science where um, even on our board's website, um, the board of uh, uh, behavior analysts, and then um, there is another organization. Um, it's called the Association for um, Behavior Analysis International. Uh, so all of these organizations, they have all of these subspecialties of areas that they say behavior analysts can practice in. And when I found that, I was like, oh my God, I could choose any of these. Just like in medicine, you could be, you know, a gynecologist, a cardiologist, an oncologist, you could do anything. I could do the same thing, but in behavior analysis, this is dope. Um, but then when I got into it, I was like, whoa, people are only working in like a couple areas. I want to change that. I want to grow that because there's research, tons of research that's been out there that has said this science should be used by everybody. If people understand how to use this, you could change your life. You could change your family's life. You could change a gigantic group's life, an organization, a country um, for the better. And that's why I do what I do um, because I want to see a great impact um, in the world. And that's why I found you guys too. I want to see 
what people are doing, talking about behavior analysis, behavior science in general, um, and how else it's being practiced. Um, because really, these two areas that are being practiced in one very, very heavily is in autism. And like, that's where a lot of people think of behavior analysts working is in like schools, um, Mm -hmm. therapy centers. And then you got the other side of it kind of small, um, but it's called organization, organizational behavior management, which is like business behavior analysis. So working in the corporate setting, um, and, helping people, you know, you've heard of a PIP before, performance improvement plan, stuff like that, incentive programs. So that's happening a little bit, but I want to grow this field and see it thrive and help the world. Well, hey, Greg, did you want to add anything? Before yeah, of course I, 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 I I'm excited about your book coming out in October. Brian will talk about that later, I'm sure. One of the things I'd like that you did that set you apart from other people, look, there's there's a lot of I get anxious because a lot of people write about stuff they don't know about and they read in a book or they studied in school and then turn it into their life's work without doing any research after that initial uh, tranche of information they found. So one of the things that's troubling is in Europe right now, they've got a lot of these seminars where people say, oh, absolutely everything about human behavior starts and ends with kinesiology and body language. And this is the end all be all. And it's not. It has nothing to do with it or very little to do with the big process. What you talk about is you talk about research. One of your quotes was, "There's a, a, that's another layer of being really successful behavior analysis is having extreme empathy and being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Because mm-hmm. if you can do, if you can't do that, it's going to be really difficult to see the whole picture and why maybe something's happening. So uh, I pride myself on being in the business longer than a lot of people. And I still, to this day, walk through a parking lot, pick a car at random, take a look inside the car, and then go in the business to try to find the person that owns that car. And that hones my skills all the time because absolutely everything you do, from a trash pull to where you park your car to what your car looks like, all that stuff that's on the floorboards of your car or the dashboard, that helps me target you. And, And again, my goal is slightly different than yours, but what I do is I read the full spectrum of human behavior, and then I compare it against the baseline that that person is operating in or that they operate in at home, and then people will say, so what? Well, that helps me figure out exactly what you need, what you need to hear from me, mm-hmm. what you need to do in your home, why you're you know, uh, thinking that you're failing. So all those things that I can do with that information are amazing to me. And then when I open somebody's eyes, like in a a lesson, Brian and I'll uh, teach a course or, you know, in the book, or when we, you know, do a webinar or something, people go, oh my God, that's amazing. We can do that. And it's like, yeah, it's called pattern recognition, Mm -hmm. you know? And, And so the analysis part is what you're doing and what we do. But the idea is, that we have to disabuse people. And I think you you wrote a lot about this as well because I've read it. Uh, there's a lexicon that's out there that's non-helpful. It's like a, a doctor telling you all of these different things that you truly don't understand and saying, well, there's my analysis. Well, if you can't use that information. So I street everything up and Brian and I are very good at taking things to a level that anybody can understand and use them immediately. Turn around in your own life and be a better lover or husband yes. or wife or you know, coach. So, so I just want to give you the kudos for that and tell you that, that we're all on the same coin. It's just, we may be on opposite sides of it, but I think all roads lead to Rome on this. I hope you, you feel that way as well. Yeah, I, I a hundred percent agree. And especially with what you said, how, yeah, if a doctor gives you their analysis, like I love to use these examples, like a doctor wouldn't tell you. So I looked at you and you got rhino sinusitis. You would be like, I'm dying. This is the worst thing ever. I should probably go get a lawyer and write my will. Um, (laughs) It's a sinus infection. That's what they describe to you. You have a sinus infection. Here's a prescription. Call me if it doesn't get better. Or cephalagia. That's a headache. You don't hear doctors (laughs) saying that. And if you do, if you're listening to this and your doctor has said that to you, please please maybe go find somebody else. Um, but Fix it, right. <laughs> that's what's happening in behavior analysis is that we, we have this wonderful science, all of these strategies that people are secretly obsessed with. People talk about this stuff all the time in books Amen. and on social media. It's everywhere. Um, and that's one of my hashtags I use 
uh, when I make my TikToks and Instagrams, it's ABA or hashtag ABA is everywhere because it is. Um, but people just don't know it because the people who are practicing it don't talk about it appropriately. We say things like, the motivating operations here are just really fighting against what the actual behavior is doing and where it's coming from already as a lay person. I'm like, I gotta go. I can't. You, yeah. you could have just said somebody's motivation is a little bit in a, in a different direction here. Uh, they have a different right. craving that maybe we, we might need to look at um, and, and change so that we can help them achieve their goals, whatever that, that sounds so much better. But we're, I, I've been guilty of it myself. Um, but that's why I wrote the book is because we need to help people speak about this appropriately and easily so that we can help everybody that we need to and so that we can grow the science as well. It just, it sounds better. It's a lot friendlier. Yeah. And, 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 you know, especially on social media, there's a lot of, uh, uh, people sort of self-diagnosing with different yeah. different things and it gets pretty bad. So there's there's a ton of uh, misconceptions um, out there. And part of it is just people's, you know, feeling like, oh, I want to be special or I'm different, you know, and so, oh, I have ADHD or I'm on the spectrum, autism spectrum, or I'm this. And it's like, all right, like uh, if that's where you're starting with, then I, I think we're we're not at the best place. And so what and and the the reason is or what i what i like to kind of get from you is sort of like i guess sort of a two part question is what are some of the the big misconceptions that you see out there at, you know especially with your training and your experience and your being a practitioner mm -hmm. and then also like th there's this thing where people talk about what's normal or typical and you know it's like well that's not typical or that's not normal and and it you know when you study behavior at least for me and and i know greg similar is like the things that we find normal or typical are is a lot more than what most people do. Like, it's like, look, people are odd. Sometimes people are weird. They do weird things. Like it doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? Right. We can't attribute value to that. So I kind of want to get your perspective on that. And from, from your background is whatever you see those big, biz, big, uh, uh, misconceptions and what are the things that you see out there that are just kind of wrong? And then, and then what, what is normal? What is typical? Yeah. So both, Really good questions. The first one, I see huge common misconceptions. Again, just basically around ABA, um, a lot of people just misunderstand what the science is. Um, again, when I tell somebody I'm a behavior analyst, they immediately go to your social worker, your counselor, or your psychologist. Um, so right away, they go to mental health, which there are behavior analysts who work in the clinical setting um, that work in mental health. Absolutely. But that's, that's one specialty of it. So there's misconception around what an actual behavior analyst is, what they're able to do. Again, like I said, a lot of people, if you have been around BCBAs before, they immediately, if they know what a BCBA is, they think they, you work in autism or you work with kids who don't follow the rules or you work in a school. Um, then there is another group of people that they know what behavior analyst uh, behavior analysis is, um, and they may have had a bad experience with it, um, and then they just label the entire science as it's not good. Don't use it. There are better strategies and therapies out there, especially like in the realm of autism. There, there are much better things to do um, with with your child to help them than ABA. Um, I, I do not doubt that people have had bad experiences with behavior analysts. Um, people have bad experiences with their doctors. People have terrible experiences with their plumbers, their hairdressers. Like, you're not everybody is good at what they do. So there are going to be people that are kind of botched professionals. Um, and that's super unfortunate. And it's unfortunate that that's in a, a really, um, it, it's a very intimate setting that you're working in, especially when you work in therapy. Um, you have to be really careful about what you do. And a lot of people make not great, mis <laughs> they make mistakes and it, it leads to bad outcomes. So um, ABA has had this bad rap also that it's, um, 
it's it's not good. I've on TikTok, people have ripped me saying like you're abusive, you abuse children, and all these things, and that is the furthest thing from what behavior analysts are doing working in autism. Because I did work in autism for a while. Um, we we will change behavior that's significant to that person. We're not just going to change a behavior just because, and that's in our ethics code too. So if there is a BCBA that's out there, that's just changing behavior just because it's convenient for them or for somebody else, not that's not good and they should be reported. Um, but if there is an issue happening where somebody is injuring themselves or, um, you know, they, they're putting themselves or other people in very dangerous situations. Um, or maybe it's not a dangerous behavior. Maybe it's just, you want to see an increase in performance from your employees or like my pictures that I see, I want to help them make a significant change with their skills so that they can throw the ball harder. That's a significant behavior. And I am going to change that. So behavior analysts don't just change anything just because it has to be significant to that person and make a very significant impact in their life or that group's life. So those are the main inconsistencies that I see with people who just aren't familiar with the science or who had a bad experience with the science. And then for your second question about what's typical, there isn't a whole lot that's typical. Um, there, it, it's, it's all relative to the person. Um, and again, we're not going to change some behavior because it just doesn't look typical. I've had plenty of families come to me in the past um, for either autism, families saying, my child is hand flapping. We have to get rid of that. My first question is, well, is it hurting them? Is it hurting somebody else? Is it, is it getting in the way of somebody else's learning? Is it getting in the way of their learning? Is it distracting to an entire class? Is it so distracting to this person? They're not able to get their things done. If you can't answer any of those questions, I'm probably not going to change it because it's not significant. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't matter if that looks atypical. Okay. Like we all have, if that's like a stimulatory behavior, like st we call it in ABA sometimes stimming. Um, people stim all the time that this sure that could be a stim. I'm stimming right now. I'm, I love, I love running my fingers across my, um, my, her, my fingers across my hands. Also my dog might bark. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, car just uh, went off. Um, so yeah, it might not look typical, but that's okay. Uh, that people do, everybody has atypical kinds of behaviors. Um, and then in pitching, what I've seen, people will say, oh, okay, uh, this, her wind up, it looks weird compared to everybody else. It doesn't really look typical. We got to get rid of it. Uh, again, if she's getting enough power, she's throwing strikes, she's able to be an effective pitcher. I don't care that that looks atypical. I'm not going to change it. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's preference from you know, your clients and that can be hard to deal with at times, but, um, typical is relative to the person. It's not, it, it's it, typical. It's again, it, it just depends yeah, on what that it, person is doing. It's, it's, it's not, you know, uh, uh, this, this large grouping of only these behaviors are typical. Only these behaviors are normal. No, it's relative. It, to the and, person. and it, and the way I look at it too is like, it, cause that's a great explanation because, you know, we look at it as, um, in, you're kind of bringing this up in a sense implicitly is, well, what's, what's the, the outcome or what's the impact or what's the effect of what they're doing? Yeah. Because that's, that's what it should be. It's because, you know, my humans are terrible in general at measurement and assessment, right? We don't measure things well. Right. Um, you know, it's, I, if I need to cut a piece of wood for something I'm building, it's very easy. I take out my tape measure. All right. We use, you know, inches and this is, you know, and I can make my cut, but mm -hmm. the, the, when it comes to things like psychology or behavior, I would say just behavior in general, right? It's not like physics, right? Physics is, it, it, there's it's math right here. Here's what it is. This is what we know. You can measure it. And unless you get really, really, really small or really way far out in the universe, then it gets a little complex, but otherwise it's, it's, you know, hard, it's difficult maybe, but 
these are the laws you understand it implicitly implicitly like you don't need to know you or be taught the um you know the the, the measurement for for what gravity is right. right you because you know what that is you're not if you jump off your roof it's going to hurt when you fall right. right but when it comes to behavior like there's a lot of complexity in it yes and so we don't always, uh, uh, we, we, you know, we don't always measure it correctly. And, and something you brought up, even when you, you first um, were introducing yourself is like, you talked about the environment and everything else. So it's, it's always like you're comparing something to something else. Every observation you make is a comparison to something. Mm-hmm. And I think what a lot of people don't know is like, okay, they can see something, but what am I comparing it to? Why am I measuring this? Right. What am, you know, every observation I make is, is in, in a sense, is, is a, every perception is a measurement of something, mm-hmm. whether it's hot or cold in the room is subjective to you. Mm-hmm. Like what the, what the temperature, what the thermostat says, that's, that's an objective measurement because that's what it is. But right. the effect could be something completely different. And it, it it's kind of, it, it seems to me difficult for people to, even who, who, who know certain things, like you brought up the great example of like the pitcher doing it different or wind up. Well, I see that with like really good trainers, like people like for teaching shooting or something like, well, that's a little different than we taught, but you know what? The really good trainer will be like, Hey, if that works for them and it's safe and it's effective, it. then that's how they do it. Yeah. Like the, it's, it's the outcome. But, um, you know, we, we don't do that with everything. It kind of takes a lot of tacit knowledge and experience. So like, what are, are there, are there common ones that you see like that or, or where, where someone, what's the best way, what I always try to get someone's perspective on for who, who's outside of our field or doesn't do what we do mm-hmm. is like, you know, it, it is in general, like, how do you teach people or how do you explain that to people on how to measure correctly or what is your comparison or why, why is this observation significant? Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like, we, fo- we focus on the vanilla. We focus on what, what's the comparative background is the most important right. part, right, to, to us. So I, I kind of just want to see, like, what you've seen in that or what your what your take is on that. I, uh, I'm getting chills with you asking me about that because this is, like, getting into the nitty-gritty of what behavior analysts do. This is so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, again, this is what behavior analysts are so good at is turning something that seems very subjective, like somebody running. Uh, or um, uh, people not showing up to work on time and turning it into an objective measurement. So to um, a typical person outside of um, working in the behavior analysis field, uh, if they wanted to start measuring something, they'd probably be like, okay, uh, if I'm if I'm looking at, uh, you know, these em- employees coming in late, um, I might, I might just say, okay, they, they showed up, they, they showed up, you know, like a couple minutes past, um, 8am. They're supposed to be here at 8am. Okay. Um, well, if that's not written down somewhere that like 8am is the exact start time, um, then that's a problem because then, then it really isn't very objective. Everybody doesn't really know the rule. Um, so what BCBAs would do is we would come in and say, okay, let's make this even more clear. Um, you can show up anytime between 8am and 810 and be on time. Still any time past 810, it's late. Um, for something that is um, a little bit more complex, like I always like to go back to sports. Um, so uh, gymnastics is a huge sport where a lot of people, they do have objective measurements for how they um, how they have their grading systems um, or point systems for, um, uh, for who takes first and second and all that. Uh, but some people argue that it's subjective at times because it's, it's also so difficult to judge those skills because they happen so fast. Um, so um, for a lay person, they might think, okay, well, um, you know, they, it, it looks like they're, they're getting, you know, seven feet off the floor, maybe, I don't know. So they might just eyeball it. Whereas behavior, behavior analysts are a lot more, rigid, um, with that, but that's how we get objective measurements. That's how we teach people. Okay. This is how you're exactly going to measure this thing. We have to have a very definitive description of what you are measuring. Um, say in gymnastics, someone's layout has to be, um, you know, at least eight feet off the floor or whatever it is. Um, we would put that in our, what we call our, um, uh, 
uh, our operational definition. Um, so we have to start with a very objective definition of what we are measuring. So everybody measures it the same um, over time, not just when we are first tracking our data and seeing, you know, what's going on. That is the definition that stays from the start of tracking it all the way through. Okay. Now we have started to change it. If it was significant, um, we need to make sure this individual maintains this behavior and then until we're done. So we are the experts at taking something that looks very subjective and making it very, very objective, um, which a lot of people it's very hard to do that because you have to yes. break it down to its most minute form. But again, we're trained to do that. Um, and that kind of separates us apart from some other professionals who might target behavior at times. Yeah. So talk about, yeah, talk about the uh, travails of, of predictive analysis. So what, what happened for our listeners, uh, Brian brought up a, a, a great question and Kendall, you did a great job answering it. What both of them were talking about in our realm, what we deal with, is called an external perspective. What happens is most per people are so interested in giving an internal perspective. This is what this means. This is what I mm -hmm. see. And they're compared mm -hmm. it against themselves as a baseline. And that doesn't mean anything. The idea is like, for example, if I was going to do a cold read on, on Kendall, I look in the back to Sam I am, the certificate that's above it, the organization, how she's dressed, uh, that she's wearing white. Uh, all risky behavior there, but she's very uh, clean with her lines and organized and the, the cork board that's next to her. All of those things are great. So I'm breaking that down. Well, the problem is now I'm a CNN analyst because I don't know if you bought that room. I don't know if your significant other built that room. I don't know if those things are valuable to you or you bid it for, uh, built it for a podcast background because you want to portray a behavior. So what we do is we have to look at 360, everything, the Hoberman. We have to move it around, and then we have to measure it against something. So we have to measure yeah. the behavior that we see against known behavior, and then we got to measure it against a baseline. And, and then mm -hmm. from that information, we have to say, well, there's likelihood. This is likely. What's going to happen if we don't impact that behavior? This is likely what's going to happen if we do a little bit of impactful this, you know, to that behavior. So we're in the same world. The, the, the difference is with BCBA, when you guys have board certified people that, that create a diagnosis, okay, the other people around are the ones that don't understand. It's generally not the person you're dealing with. Like, like if we're dealing with a supervisory level, They'll look at us and go, yeah, but I, I don't understand why you can't just point to the school shooter. It's like, wait a minute, that, that's not the way any of this works. This is, you know, we're not in Oz uh, uh, here or, or Wingardium Leviosa. You know, we don't have the Harry Potter's magic wand. With you, and, and I love the sports analogy as well, what you do is you have to look at a situation. You have to look at the person in that situation. You have to understand that sometimes when we go to the doctor, we lie to the doctor. You have to have to say that sometimes yeah. we put on, you know, egotistical behaviors, which, which, you know, we use to trump some other void in our life. And we have to go through all of that other stuff and go, it's getting better or it's getting worse. Or there's an attack likely or it's never going to happen. So I think that right. you're doing the same basic thing. And I think that sometimes mm -hmm. the misunderstanding doesn't come necessarily from uh, uh, the client. Sometimes it comes from society because society doesn't yes. understand that. And, and that goes back to your uh, point, Brian. People are horrible at what they think is wrong with them. And if you're getting opinion-based testimony, so uh, if I ask you what are your symptoms and you give me an honest portrayal of the symptoms, I can do more with that than if I say, okay, what do you think is wrong with you? Because with, with me, I'm always on WebMD and I have a brain cloud. So I'm not sure what that means. But no, no it's, it's actually UTI, Greg. You're going to get better. But you see what I'm trying to say? So when, when I, look at, I look at how you're approaching it, I love it because it's very clinical and very basic, and people would be able to understand and get behind it. Whereas I see that this mysticism, we have to shine lights on those folks, and we have to say, that's not how any of this yes. works, and you know, get to the, the root cause. Do you find that once that epiphany occurs, once that people see what it is that you do, do you find that it's easier to, to get your desired end state? Absolutely, because then, then you have buy-in, and that's why it's so important to explain everything basically to whatever stakeholders you're working with, clients, um, uh, people who might not be directly your clients, but who might work with that client or live with that client. So you're trying to get this picture of their life or the, um, the 
the office setup or um, their practice environment to see how they're training. Um, and then when you go to do your analysis or when you're just explaining what you're going to do and how the progression of, um, of behavior analysis works, um, if you're not able to do that and speak to that person in their language, that connection is going to be broken right away and no rapport yep. is going to be built. And they're probably going to say, all right, I'm going to try to go find somebody else who's going to help me. Um, but yeah, if you can mm -hmm. do that, if you can speak to someone in their language, you're going to make them feel really comfortable. You're going to be able to right. make a really big impact in their life. And then they're going to feel a lot better about what is about to happen. And they're probably going to go talk to their friends and family about, you know what, I'm working with this person. I'm working with this behavior analyst who's helping me get up earlier in the morning. It's phenomenal. It's the same science that they use yep. with kids who are having issues in school. It's the same science that mm -hmm. they use um, to uh, teach Olympic athletes how to run faster. It's insane. And it's getting me up earlier in the morning. That's great. So that's, again, the level of impact that communication yeah. can yeah, have I, on, I, on people. It's it, great. I totally agree with that. And Brian, just one quick comment here. Look, you can go yeah. to any, 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 uh, 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 Rite Aid or, or I, I'm in a small town, so we don't have a pharmacy. Actually, I have to go to a witch doctor who uh, comes out with a chicken foot and a, tells you what you got. Well, your, your doctor, your, your doctor also is like the, the vet and takes care exactly. of the horses. And, <laughs> and the barber, <laughs> you give it a but yeah. you can go to any <laughs> pharmacy and you can go in and say, I have a headache. And a person will lead you to a, a counter that has aspirin and Advil and Tylenol and all of mm -hmm. these other things. And what I see sometimes is people go to a doctor and they go, well, they've got me on this med. And, you know, one of the side effects or you watch a commercial with a side effect and you, you grab the person. I, I'm a touchy feely. I grab the person. I go, have you ever read all of the stuff that's in a normal bottle of over the counter aspirins and what it can do to you? Well, we don't. See, the things that are familiar to us, we don't dig deep. We don't look under the veneer. Right. We don't want to investigate those because we just take them for granted. Right. And our human behavior, look, if you would have had a counselor, uh, uh, and Brian, this is for you, for the love of God. If you would have had a counselor like Kendall when you were growing up, you wouldn't have had all of these behaviors that we got to unpack now and speak <laughs> with a megaphone, please come off the roof, and all that other stuff. But, but we don't have that. We don't have those life coaches. Now, we have coaches at different parts of our life. And we have parents and we have significant others. And you know what? If I'm going to conduct predictive analysis, the more of those people you have, the better unpacked you'll be and the better you'll do in life. But the less that you have the ability to bounce that off. Look, I'm feeling that this is normal, clinically normal, uh, but it might not be. I feel that this soothing behavior that I'm doing is is okay, right? But it might not be. And that's the art of what you're doing. You're you're communicating that so I can, we, a siloed communication means it's never going to get anywhere. We'll draw an unreasonable conclusion and then run with it. And that's not helping anybody. So I, I like this no. because where the discussion is going is like, look, measurement and assessment leads to a better conclusion. And that's what we do. Yep. We just do that over a, we're looking for different things. You know, you're looking for the pitch. I'm looking for a bomb in placer. You know, you're 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 uh, uh, looking for how, how can this person improve themselves. I'm saying on a highway full of cars, this is the one you want to interdict because that's the most right. dangerous vehicle that's coming up. So, but it's no different really because what we're doing is right. we're comparing and comparing and measuring and saying, hey, that banana's too ripe. That one's not ripe enough. We're either having banana right. bread or we got to leave it out in the sun. I love that. So, so you simplify things, which means I'm a big fan. Because most people are overblown and you can't even get through the diagnosis without having to have a, you know, PDF on your side or a dictionary yes. to reference some of the material. That yes, there. yes. Can, can you kind of like explain or, or give sort of an example if you've got some like, how do you one of the things you talk about and, and Greg was talking about it when we go with internal versus external baselines and how we read a situation or a person or mm -hmm. behaviors, right? Um, and one of the things that's that's hard to do, and I, I kind of, Greg and I kind of argue about this a little bit. Yep. Um, maybe it's just the way we talk about it, but is is when you say like taking another person's perspective, like it's psychologically, that's very, very difficult to do. Like mm -hmm. Kendall, I have no idea what, like 
we've only been talking for half an hour. We had one like 15 minute phone call before this and I Googled you. Right. So I don't, but I don't know your life experiences. I don't know what you see. I don't know how you think. And so it's difficult. Like, how am I supposed to take your perspective on this? How am I supposed to get in the head or in the mind of someone else? Like I've got like a little, uh, he's now like 13 months, you know, boy. Um, it, it's easier that because it's like, this kid's me. Like I see me, like this kid literally is me, but biologically is, you know, I, I help create him. But, but like even his behaviors and even how he acts and points and stuff like I can get it because I live with him. I see him every day and I do it. But when it comes outside of that, right, it, it can get, it can get difficult. And, you know, so what are your, how do you do that? How do you shift perspective? How do you take someone else's perspective or, or do you even have to? Cause that's my thing is what I tell people is like, look, it's really hard to psychologically take another person's perspective, but, but you don't have to, right. You don't have to know what they're thinking. So you have to have some comparison. So like, how do you describe that? Or what do you tell people to do? Or when they ask you, Hey, I'm sure you have people come up, Hey, I've got my kid doing this or someone's I'm watching this. I'm sure you get all these wild questions yeah. that most of them are completely irrelevant <laughs> and don't matter in the big picture. So like, how do you, how do I filter through that? If I'm just listening to this going like, yeah, maybe it's my, about my kids or my neighbor's kid or someone I saw, mm -hmm. like, how do I use, what are your lenses that you use? So, um, we use a few different, um, measurement strategies in like that assessment portion of when we are looking at behavior because we can't put changes in place before we learn about what's going on. Um, so when we're in that assessment phase um, of behavior analysis, we will take objective data, which first, like we talked about, we have to have a really, really good definition of what we're supposed to be targeting. Um, so for instance, say, um, say it's, uh, a, we'll, we'll go to a child, um, example, say a child's in school, um, and they just aren't doing their homework and they, they haven't turned anything in all year and it's like two months in. So what we will do is we will interview the teacher will interview the child if they're able to, um, if they're able to talk for themselves, uh, we'll interview the family. So we get all this background information of what could possibly be happening and what other people, other people's perspectives are of the behavior that's going on. Um, and then we will take objective data on what we are seeing. Um, so uh, for a behavior analyst that would be working in this area, they they might go into the home or they might go into the school and take data on what is happening right before that child is supposed to be engaging in doing their homework. Um, what is happening when they're doing their homework or if they're not doing their homework, what are they doing? And then if they did do their homework um, or didn't do it, what happened right after that? So then we try to find these patterns of what is going on in these situations. And then once we can put all these pieces together, um, and sometimes it happens pretty quickly because some behaviors are very, very consistent. Others, it might take a little bit longer to understand because it might be happening across all different environments. Um, it only might be specific to one environment or one person. They might only not be doing their homework for one teacher. Um, once you can get all that information, then we can move forward. So we we do what you guys you guys kind of call it pattern analysis, which it it might be different than this, but we do try to find those consistencies of this is what is happening. This appears like this is why it's happening. Now we can put this change in place. So we rely heavily on that objective observation of I'm not going to try to get in your head. If you want to tell me what's going on in your head, I'm going to write that down because that is probably impacting also what you're doing. But I'm not really worrying about what's going on in here or in here, again, unless you tell me. Um, I'm worried about what's going on out here um, because we can kind of change that um, to help that person meet their goals, stay on track, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah and, and Brian, I, I think a great that, thing yeah. there. A great parallel discussion. Look, uh, uh, you're speaking the right stuff, to Kendall. You're going to uh, uh, hopefully resonate very well with our audience, and I think they're going to uh, 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 listen and follow up and buy your book because it's really good stuff and it's very simple stuff. So when, let's go back to the pattern. So I was I was sexually abused as a kid. So if I was going to conduct an interview with, for example, a pedophile, 
uh, the easiest thing for me to do is bring my confirmation bias, bring all my hate and vitriol and all the things from my internal perspective on it and lay it out while I'm doing the interview. Well, it might give me some sense of relief, but I'm not going to get anywhere with figuring out what's inside the pedophile's head. So the difference between Brian is Brian is classically trained and then has a lot of street exposure. I had all street exposure and no classical training. So when we talk about putting ourselves in the shoes of somebody else, I do it because what I have to do is force myself to do the external perspective. And then I go over and ask people. So the great thing is I'm like the stumbling detective and and I go over and I go, excuse me, what does this mean? What do you mean by this? Why are you wearing this ring on this hand rather than on this hand? And and through that, I, I gain a lot of information. I'll give you a very, very brief one that speaks directly to this. So IEDs, improvised elect, uh, electron, explosive devices were very different in Iraq than they were in Afghanistan. But the same bomb makers taught those criminals. So then there was tendencies Mm -hmm. to follow a pattern. So we could actually figure out where a bomb came from, who that guy taught, what the pigtail splice was like. And that was very important to predict what was going to happen. So I'm in this meeting and they got all these geniuses from the Department of Defense and Department of Justice and ATF and everything in Afghanistan. And they're all in this room, in this bomb protected room. And they were talking about this new thing where they were putting bombs and culverts on roads, these IEDs that that, that would blow up and kill the people. And I had been on the road. I was out there talking to the people. And the reason they do that is because they don't have to dig a hole because people are lazy. So if I find a culvert under a road and just put a bomb in it, it's much simpler. So there's always an analysis, but there's also the mm-hmm. answer that the person, why why do you cut off the ends of the bread? Why do you do this? Why do you do it? So I'm yes. uh, uh, using culture as context and love the interview process. And you both are, are very clinically trained. So you you stack the cards and everything. But both of us and all three of us on this call understand there's also an intervention strategy where you got to go more quickly. This is going to harm somebody. So we have to intervene. So, yes. so if you take all of those, what you have is now you have this big body of work that says pattern analysis works because people repeat behaviors. We have this whole body of work that says physically, physiologically, chemically, scientifically, uh, uh Uh, cognitively, that people repeat behaviors because of these reasons. And that's forced society and humans to say, okay, then give me a checklist. And checklists blow. They're absolutely horrible. You can't give one. So, So folks, if you're listening to my voice and you're hearing this call, listen to what they're saying. Measurement and assessment and comparison and baselines are how you come up with a, a analysis and a mm-hmm. diagnosis, not saying, well, they're 3.1 on this scale and 2.7 on that one. I hope you agree with me on that one because it 100%. sounds like we're all in violent agreement. Okay, perfect. Yes. <laughs> that wasn't really a uh, question. I was just the... happy. Yeah, happy. no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Exactly. Greg, Greg got some some valid validation on the on yeah, for the, call, the first time in sixty two years. It's somebody yeah, is on yeah. Right, the right to your music. So thank God. Well, I'm 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 never gonna give you validation. So well, but but no that that all goes back to kind of like you know it goes back to you know what is this person doing specifically yep. and then what is the effect it has on them on others yes. on the environment yep. like and that's where you can come in because like you even said and and I, I i see this too um with organizations where it's it's like oh we got to we got to get better at communication it's like okay well how did you arrive that at that solution already right? yes. what problem, you have right. a, you haven't clearly defined what the problem right. is and you're already jumping into a solution. Right. How do you see stuff like that? I'm guessing. Oh my God. All the time. And that like, that's, that is such a perfect example of, um, again, ev- most people have really good intentions. Anybody who's yes. saying that they, they want to help make whatever situation it is better and relieve whatever issues are happening. So their intentions are good, but to, a non-behavior analyst, they say, we, we have to get better communication. Whereas a behavior analyst would say, I have observed that um, there have been four people not on our um, meetings. And these three people haven't responded to any of the emails that we've been sending out. So let's look at how we can increase attendance at meetings and increase people's responses over email. Boom. Great. Um, 
that's that's where behavior analysts come in and we can really help because we can we can make people's lives easier so that it's not just this this dark cloud very you know gray space we have to increase communication that's impossible i i i don't yeah it's yeah. a, a yeah. really really difficult task um but we're, what you said i loved what you said how um both of you guys have said something about like you have to find out someone's why why you're doing this why you cut the bread like this why you have to get a hot dog every time you go to this baseball park um that's what we do that's like one of the parts of things that behavior analysts do um we do that analysis it's it, to a lay person i would describe that as like a motivational analysis what's motivating you to do this so that's where we find the patterns right. we find out in our jargon, we call them functions of behavior. So we see that there are four major functions or four main whys of why people do things. It's either for attention, escape or avoidance, access to tangibles, things, and then automatic, meaning it just feels good. Um, but sometimes you don't have to actually go that route because sometimes you're not trying to find out why why are you doing this why aren't you doing this maybe you're just trying to increase somebody's skills um like in performance training for sports for right. work like you're onboarding somebody that's just skill training um but that's another thing that we're experts in because we know how to take a really really complex behavior um like simone biles doing I don't even know the names of all of the different flips <laughs> and uh, like her routines yeah, and everything right? like that. Crazy. But a behavior analyst would able be, would be able to, who is an expert in behavior analysis and gymnastics would be able to break down those movements and teach that to someone who is trying to learn that. Now I'm not saying that everybody's going to be right. able to be Simone Biles later on in life. That would be incredible. Right. But, um, we know how to break down those skills and make it more realistic for somebody to attain those goals that they have um, and be able to do those uh, flips yeah. and all those movements um, for them. So just more. It, yeah. yeah. And, and so we, we do a lot of, a lot of the same stuff when you, you know, you talk about how do you, how do you turn the subjective into the objective? Mm -hmm. And that's why yep. we use a lot of the that we use in the lexicon that we have and you know because it does that it's saying well this is a category it fits into here and now i have a way to sort of measure it and it yeah. comes down to those different sort of operational definitions mm -hmm. right that, that you talked right. about and, yeah. and we have even even our own that we use and so did that play into because i, I kind of want to you, you got the book coming out called uh uh, talk behavior to me. Mm -hmm. And it's the Routledge Dictionary of the top 150 behavior analytical terms and translations. Yes. So was that kind of fit into what you're trying to do here is, is, is define some of this stuff for people better? Or yes. what was the, what was the reason for, for the book? Yeah. So I just, I saw that there is a huge lack of people talking about behavior analysis, basically. Um, and because I love the science so much, I was seeing, and I don't have actual data on it, but I see how, how pigeonholed and how narrow our practice is with only like one to two populations. And I see that some of that is because we can't talk to people about what we do. If you put a BCBA at a bar and have someone approach them and say, what do you do? The conversation that on on the behavior analyst side would be so long, and they it would it would probably get more complex and confusing the longer that it would go on. And that the the person who approached them would probably be like, "Okay, I got to go to the bathroom," and they would probably leave because um, it's it's just it's too much. Um, so I wanted to simplify things for everybody to teach practitioners and students how to talk to non-behavior analysts about what we do so we can increase our impact, grow the field, um, but then on a smaller scale, increase how effective our treatments are by making it easier for um, the people who are implementing our strategies and all of our plans, making it easier for them to understand and then do it right. Because if we are just writing all of our plans in jargon and teachers, right. parents, youth coaches, professional coaches, um, anybody who's not a behavior analyst, they're usually the ones who are taking these plans and running them. If they don't understand what we're writing, 
what, why are we even working? What are we doing? Um, we, we're, not, we're not going to help anybody if we can't talk to people in their language. So I saw that there was a huge lack of resources out there for our practitioners and our students. Um, to achieve this. And so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm doing this. Um, I went to a great talk out in Boston um, in 2021. And uh, the researcher, uh, Dr. Kimberly Marshall, she's out of uh, University of Oregon. Uh, she's an expert in um, dissemination of behavior analysis. And this is what she talked about at the end of her speech. She said, you know, uh, from this research, this should prove to everybody that, you know, we need to increase resources, do more exercises with our students in school to teach them um, about this ethical code that we have, where it says we have to talk in an understandable manner to all of our clients and stakeholders. Um, this is going to help support them. We can't just tell people you have to talk basically to people and make sure they understand it because this is really isn't talk to anybody directly. Um, so right after I left there, I said, I, I called my mom right away. I go, I think I'm going to write a book. Um, and That's yeah, right. yeah. Um, and, but it's not just for our practitioners to talk basically to people, anybody who is interested in behavior analysis, um, or who wants to understand if you're getting services from a behavior analyst, whether your company is, or your child is, or, um, maybe you're working with a behavioral sports performance coach like myself. Um, and you have these plans that they give you, and it might have some jargon in there, or you just want to understand what they're doing with you better, even though they might be talking very basically to you and you understand everything, this is going to help you understand it on a way more basic level um, and make you feel more comfortable about um, what you're getting into. No, that's yeah, great. And, and those things are 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 important, right? Uh, having the different, you know, operational terms, the, the different ways to describe something because they can be different for you than they are for me, yep. but we're talking about the same thing. Yes. So what it allows you to do is obviously use that or use those and it, it, use the terms, use a process to conceptualize it in whatever area of your life mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever reason or, or, you know, whatever you're using it for. And so do you, do you have any like, um, do you have any things that you tell people like on how to look or looking for things or stuff to look out for? And I don't mean like the checklist, like, Hey, when you see these things, it means, you know, that, cause it's never, it's never a squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is not how behavior is, right? right? It's, 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 it's chaos. It's, it's very complex. <laughs> so meaning, meaning like, like Greg and I'll give uh, uh, folks like examples uh, when they're talking about looking for, you know, the seams and gaps of an area looking for negative space where do criminals terrorists insurgents where do they get in from how do they do this and so like we play like observational games where you go i want you when you're out driving around walking around look for um look for any feral cats in your neighborhood and because cats they don't just go strutting down the middle of the street right, right. where do they hide? they hide they hide underneath cars they go in between buildings right they they're careful on their movement well guess who else acts that way right a lot of criminals act that yep. way too so it's like and the idea is if I just tell you, go look for the guy, you know, trying to break into a place, you're never going to see that. Right. But if you go out today and start looking for feral cats, you're going to realize like, damn, there's a lot of cats. In my <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yes. Just wandering around. <laughs> so the idea is you, you get, you get a reward. You actually get some practice in it and you get, you know, you get a little bit of validation and you, and you get better at it. But I was just curious is like, do you have anything that, that you do or that you tell people as like a general practice of, of, of things to do? Yes. Um, so I'm so happy I put this in my book because I, when I was writing it, I was like, oh, I could, I could just make this like a translational dictionary and, and it'll, we'll end it there. But at the end of my book, I was like, I want to give people some general tips that they can use because I know they're going to be non-behavior analysts who are reading this. So let's help people learn how to use the science very easily. So um, I have a couple of them that I'll read off. Um, there are, I think I have about maybe 12 um, that are at the end of the book, but um, the first one is you have to be the best listener and observer in the room. Um, because a lot of the times what happens is behavior analysts, especially new behavior analysts will go in um, and they'll have, you know, all their data collection system stuff. They got their clipboard and their iPad and all these things. And then you have behavior technicians coming up and talking to you. You got people messaging you. You're trying to multitask when you're trying to assess a behavior because you're constantly assessing. It's like we're, we're street researchers. We are constantly researching, taking data, putting in strategies, changing all these things. But if you can't be in the moment and put 
your pen or your iPad down, you're going to miss a lot of really important things. Um, Because behavior, when we look at it, the things that we look at are what happens directly before behavior occurs, like within the first five seconds before a behavior occurs, and then what happens within five seconds of that behavior ending. So you have to A, know what you're looking at, B, have your eyes wide open and completely focused on this one thing because you have to catch these things so quickly. Um, And there are other analyses that we do that you're just constantly writing or typing down what is happening. And if you can't observe, you're not going to have a great assessment, which is going to lead to a faulty treatment, which is going to lead to the person not meeting their goals or progressing. So um, you have to be able to observe and listen very, very well. Um, So going along with that, observe before you make moves. Uh, One of the other biggest issues um, that happens in behavior analysis is people right away, even though we're, we're taught to assess before we put changes in place, I'm guilty of this all the time. Um, I'm just an anxious person in in general. So when, you know, a new pitcher comes to me um, or a parent comes to me and says, they threw so many balls. They walked 10 people this weekend. My brain immediately is like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not helping them. This isn't good. Um, Or if it's a new student, I'm like, I I hope I can help them. You know, I'm maybe I'm thinking that we need to do more uh, snapping drills. We need to do more leg drive. Before you go there, you have to know what's happening. So you have to observe and get all the information before you can even worry about how you're going to change it. Because you can't change something that you don't know anything about. So you have to learn about it first. And that, when you're just plainly observing, you can't do that and try to think about all these changes and your worries and anxieties about, I don't know if I can do this. You can't really do those at the same time when you're completely in the moment. Um, And in behavior analysis, we call that an incompatible behavior when you can't do two things at the same time. Um, And then the last thing, which I feel like is the most important out of anything we do in behavior analysis um, is you have to be consistent with whatever strategies you're using. Um, And it doesn't just mean you're consistent for a day or an hour. You have to be consistent over a long period of time um, with however it is written in that plan that you were supposed to be acting. When, you know, when this person does email you back on time, if it says in the plan, you're supposed to send them back, thank you so much for getting back to me, or you're supposed to, I don't know, say, so you have some employee like reward board, you're supposed to put a star up there. Great. You have to do that. You have to keep doing it because nobody ever mastered anything by doing it once in a while or just one time. So consistency is huge. And it's something we preach all the time um, to our clients and stakeholders, our students that we work with. You have to do the same thing all the time until we say it's okay to change it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll be a quick translator for for Kendall to our normal audience for uh, uh, first responders. What Kendall said is you have lights on your vehicle and a siren and you're rushing to an unknown trouble where you've got limited information coming in from an RP on the scene and a dispatcher. And you, as a copper, have already decided how you're going to handle the scene and the situation and calm things down. And that's why cops die because we're rushing into the situation with scant information. Another sales pitch for your book. Uh, uh, I surround myself with translators because sometimes I speak in parables that I don't understand. It just information comes out in that manner. And earlier when we were talking, I said the white shirt represented risky behavior, Kendall. And what I meant by that is I have to wear dark shirts. Why? Because I'm a mess maker. When I'm I'm drinking, I'm always wearing it and I'm up in front of people all the time. So your risky behavior is that you know that you can hold it together. So I have to have people around that say, what Greg is trying to tell you is this. So the reason I'm excited about your book coming out, and I was so thankful to be able to talk to you, is common sense, street level interventions for me work the best. And when people understand that they're contributing, uh, uh, like listening to somebody, and they're sitting there going, don't you want to write any of this down? Not yet. I'm, I'm enthralled. Go on. Yeah, keep I going. I love that. And, and, you know, and this is how we're going to learn about other people. This is how we're going to fix things. Uh, uh, self-help books, 
<laughs> Listen, if you knew how to help yourself, you wouldn't be buying the book. Uh, uh, so uh, my <laughs> thing is that uh, I like this approach. I, I'm very enthralled by it. And, and uh, I just think that when you said don't sell yourself short on the translational aspect of the book, because even the layperson is going to get something out of it. They're going to read it and they're going to be able to compare it to their own life and go, wow, that's me. And that's helpful too. seeing that, you know, the, you got to show up every day engaged. And the only way to be engaged is to understand what your role is. So this book is going to speak volumes to you understanding what that person means, why that person shunned you, why you're turning people off. You know, uh, all of those are part of the subtext of what you're talking about. And I, I love it. That's all I got to say. Brian. And, I'm sorry. and you know, and, and what, what, what happens with, you know, th this is why I love talking to someone sort of from a, a different realm that that's in, in the similar, you know, doing something similar, but in a kind of a different, different domain, maybe, um, you know, you brought up some things that everyone goes, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's common sense. I get that. It's like, no, but you did, you don't, you didn't do it. Like right. you, you said, all right, you know, cause you put it as what, be the uh, best listener, you know, in, in the room, right. Be, you know, just shut your mouth and open your ears. And, you know, cause we always say like our, our, one of our principles is that, you know, humans are constantly on transmit, right. People teach you how they want to be treated. We're constantly just transmitting everything about us. So I have to one tune into the right frequency <clears throat> and then not jam a square peg into a round hole. Right. So I have to not let that, let that take over. And, you know, even with you, you're talking about listening and people are like, okay, yeah, no, I listen to him. It's like, no, like e this is even, even military has a term called sills, stop, look, listen, smell. And like, so I get inserted with my team via helicopter in the middle of the night somewhere we jump off. Sometimes depending on the mission, you literally sit there for an hour. And you just stop, you look, you listen, you smell, you hear, see what's going on in the area, see if your presence just attracted anywhere. I mean, for an hour, you just don't say a damn thing and you just sit there and then you decide to start moving towards wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's that that's the idea because you're just getting that baseline, you're getting that sample, you're acclimating yourself to the situation. So you're using that that external baseline, not an internal one of what you think is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And it seems so so obvious, but but people really don't do it. Right. And then what happens is like, like, like Greg did, you know, the, the thing earlier in the call when he's like, okay, this is what you're showing me. Kind of like you're highly organized. You've got all your stuff neat in your room. You've got a cool little neon sign in the background with, you know, everything. Or, yeah. It, you've got all this stuff and it's, it's, it's well put together. It's clean. It says, but here's the thing. I don't even know if that's your room. I don't even right. know if it's this like a, 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 you know, that the perfect example of that is especially this happened, especially during COVID for a lot of like and it happened mostly in D.C., all the talking heads on different news shows because they're mostly doing stuff remotely. There were companies that would come in, you could hire them and they would put in like a bookshelf, uh, make a decorative wow. Zoom background. I didn't for know you. that, but I don't doubt oh, it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it was big, big money, too. And it was all certain. And then they could, uh, based on what your preferences were, they would highlight certain books out there that you want. So you, you, you they would wow. cultivate that image for you to transmit to the world to show that, look at me, I know what I'm talking about. And this, I mean, I mean, that's, that's the idea. Like, you know, if you like, you can only see so much behind me. But if you saw where my this is my little loft office above our garage, like, this is Brian's head. I've got like the guitars over here. I've got some stuff stacked up over here that I need to get to. I've got my books back there, the couch that I sit like it really is, but but you only get this perspective. Right. You're only seeing what I'm I'm showing you. So those those simple things is where I see things go wrong. So I, I, I like what you're doing um with the book and then kind of expanding this this sort of reach because you know especially with bcbas it's it's so much focused on kids yes. and intervention strategies and then that takes on a life of its own with social media yep. and every little thing gets picked apart that's why greg even brought up like kinesics and body language you know at the, at the beginning and where it's like you can't start there yeah. you have to know where you're starting from and and i i just love getting your your perspective or background from this. So, you know, I don't, um, I want to, I want to allow you to like any, any, you, anything else you, you kind of want to add or, or takeaways for people, um, from what you've seen, especially stuff with, with kids and, and sort of your, you know, perspective on, um, you know, everyone's really scared of social media and, and these different apps and the way things are changing. You know, I always say, People have been the same for a really, really long time. It's not, it's not the app. It's not the phone. It's the person, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the gun. It's not the drugs. It's not the, it's the person. Mm -hmm. it's, if we, if we shift our focus to that 
And people are worried, well, what do I do with my kid? What do I do about this? And my opinion of this is sort of, okay, what are you doing yourself? Because I see adults are much worse at this than children are. And, and if you're doing that around your kid, all they're going to do is mimic your behavior. Exactly. So if you're constantly on the phone when you're, when you're hanging out with them and checking your Instagram, like, well, then that's what they think is normal or typical. Yep. So it's actually not them that you have to worry right. about. It, it's you. So I, I'm just curious from your perspective, like what you see or what you tell parents or what you've seen before and kind of where you think um, the, the social media impact, what it, what it really is, not just versus what Every, what it's always talked about. Um, so like social media impact on like what people are saying about behavior analysis or like how social media, how it's, how it's really affecting our behavior, oh, like in, oh especially at younger age. Oh, I, yeah. this could be an entire podcast in itself. It could be. It uh, could be. <laughs> um, but it, what I see is it totally draws people out of the moment and it, for, again, I don't have I don't have data on this, but from my observations, I'm seeing decreases in how people are connecting with anybody and anything around them. Um, a lot more risky and dangerous behavior. Like people, people are texting constantly or on social media um, at the red light. And you, you might take your foot off the brake for a second and don't realize that you're rolling and then you get into a fender bender. Um, so all these things that maybe weren't happening as much before social media occurred um, are starting to pop up now because of it. We're also constantly comparing ourselves to other people. I'm super guilty of that because I'm an influencer. I am on social media all the time. Um, and it's it's not the best environment for us uh, to really thrive. Um, because when you're constantly comparing, you're getting pulled out of the moment that you're in right now. You're maybe not interacting with the people around you or your pets as much. Um, you're not attending to um, what you should be, the stove that's on, maybe uh, all the work that's in front of you. We're, we're being less productive. We're we're living less right. in the moment. Um, and we're, it, it's to me when I feel when I'm on social media more, even though I, I love it and it's so fun, I almost feel like sick, like something's wrong. <laughs> like, and yeah. I'm like, man, why do I feel like so off? It's because I've been living in this world in this box for, you know, two hours or whatever it is. I really try not to be on, <laughs> on social media for that long, but, um, it happens. So, um, all of these risky things and these, these things that we really, we talk about like, Oh, we don't like, we don't like being ignored. We don't, we don't like when people are not vigilant when they drive. We're doing that because we're on social media. Yeah. Um, social yeah. media is wonderful for so many things. It allows us to connect to a lot of people, but, um, I think that there has to be a lot more education for the young population on how to engage with it appropriately and what to expect. Maybe some, uh, maybe some restrictions on who can be on there, like what age and duration um, restrictions. Yeah. Maybe there also needs to be after you know when when you become an adult, you can have full access to this. Here are here are some tips on how you can engage with your social media audience and your platform and, and whatever um, in a healthy manner uh, because here are the effects that can come from it, which there are resources out there, but um, just constantly putting them out there for people because if we're not prompted, we're not going to do it if we're not, if it's already yeah. not a habit. So, yeah. Well, um, Greg, I'll let you uh, uh, kind of get any, any final comments or any other questions for Kendall while we have her on here. I had so much more we could talk about. I think this would be a fun conversation to revisit once the book comes out yeah. and we've all had a chance to look around. I think we should have you back on the show. I think Wait, that the, there's a – the book comes out in October. No, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can pre-order it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can, yeah. But I'll, what I'll I'm saying the is, links there. You can pre-order yeah, it now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not pre-ordering unless it includes a, like an autographed edition with the Sam I Am moniker on it. Hey, stuff. you got it. Remember that. <laughs> That's the way I am. But – uh, uh no, but this was a fun spirited discussion about simple stuff that everybody can wrap their head around. It mm -hmm. demystifies some of it. It puts it back in the 
the realm of you writing your own narrative. And that's what people really want. That's why people are really out there looking for an answer. And this is an answer. It's not the answer. We don't offer the answer. Right. We offer an answer. And mm -hmm. I think that's important. So uh, I just want to tell you, thanks. You lived up to all the expectations that I had. Can't wait to see the book. Oh, thank you guys for having me on. I was, I'm, I was so excited to talk with you because I know you guys are in a different domain of human behavior. And I love learning about what other people are doing because that's why I got into this is to grow the science and have the yeah. biggest impact possible. You guys are awesome. Well, Aww. we, we appreciate, you know, appreciate you coming on here, sharing your perspective, obviously for, for listeners and everything, we'll have the links to, you, you, you know, you and your social media and, and the, and the book to pre-order, you know, uh, in the episode details and all that. And, you know, you can always look her up at, at the behavior influencer on Instagram and then TikTok. I'm not on TikTok just cause it's not, I don't, you know, the, the, I think the Chinese government has enough information Good about me already because they feel <laughs> so, so much, but surveillance and uh, my my you know different things have been hacked that if you have my information in it, so uh, they have enough on me. But um, but you know we 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 appreciate you coming on here. Um, you know I, I think you know if you're interested to maybe maybe something again uh, we we could organize something on just kind of getting into the yes. social media stuff yes. because it's it's huge and we've got sort of different perspective between the three of us in general. And yep. then I kind of want to get like how, how to address it. We get questions on it all the time. And, you know, I run into the same thing where, you know, I do like, all right, Brian, if you're going to grow this stuff on Arcadia, on the social media, you got to be more consistent. It's like, okay. So I start being more consistent. And then, then I realize like, Jesus, I'm spending so much time on here. I, it's not good for me and I don't like it. But then, so then people are like, how do you, like, you just post and then you won't even open the app for like another week. I was like, no, they're like, you have to engage with people. If yep. you want to grow, it's like, ah, man, I don't really want to do that. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> But it's it's so it's it's tough. But that's just part of that's just like a generational thing and how we use it. So um, there's a lot we get into that. But but either way, kind of like I I really appreciate you coming on. You know, talk behavior to me. Uh, sounds like a really cool cool book. I'll have the links for everyone. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. And don't forget that training changes behavior. <laughs>